And we are live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Association Chat this week. As we get started, I want to let you guys know about a couple of things that are going on. Uh, one is if you have the chance to log into Crowdcast and participate live here, it's a much better experience because we get the opportunity to see your questions as you type them in and address them. Um, but also, we have this lovely call to action button at the bottom that is talking about the association chat happy hour and vr adventure so if you're very interested in virtual reality or augmented reality um we're going to be having an association chat happy hour in the dc area coming up and we would love for you to participate and join us live meet some other association chat folks in person and uh yeah i think it'll be fantastic all right, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Association Chat, your weekly online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm the host of Association Chat, Kiki Latalian, and I'd like to give a shout out to one of our wonderful sponsors, Fontiva, for their support of Association Chat and the association community. Now, for today's show, we're talking about secession planning. CEO secession planning is one of the most important duties that every association board of directors and every incumbent CEO needs to think about. But very few associations, even the large, sophisticated ones, have developed a comprehensive secession plan. Why? Why is it? Why does this happen? So we're going to explore why that is and how to develop a succession plan with two leaders in the association industry. We're talking with Gary LeBranch and Lorraine Labitt. Labitt? That's it. Yes. Okay. Success. <laughs> I like, I'll take the early easy wins. Um, Gary is the president and CEO of National Investor Relations Institute and the author of over 300 articles, podcasts, and columns. He's also the author of a book released just this year called The Association CEO Secession Toolkit, and that was published by ASAE. And Lorraine is National Association Practice Leader and Senior Client Partner at Corn Ferry International. She has years of experience managing some of the most high-profile executive searches done in the association industry. So if anybody's going to be able to talk with us today and really know what they're talking about when it comes to succession planning, here we go, guys. All right. So thanks, Gary. Thanks, Lorraine, for joining us today on Association Chat. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Okay. Great to be here. I am thrilled because um, some of these questions are, um, they're meaty. They're meaty questions. And I read, for instance, that the average CEO stays in his or her position for just seven years. And 40% of association CEOs are either at or approaching retirement age. And yet... Associations aren't doing a very good job at secession planning. So why is that, you guys? Why why is it in the first place that this is even something we have to, to discuss? Why are why is it such a hard thing for organizations to to get moving with secession planning? And I'll address uh, Gary. I'll I'll shoot this one over to you to start. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Kiki, and thanks for having uh, me here today. It's uh, it's a great, great, uh, great honor and fun to be part of this. Um, you know, I think um, we uh, associations don't like to uh, don't have these plans, and we don't like to talk about these plans uh, for the same reasons that um, you know, as an adult, we don't want to get to the job of doing our own will, you know, and setting up that file in case of my departure from this planet, you know, open up the file and here are the insurance policies and, you know, here's where the bank accounts are, here's the key to the safety deposit box and that sort of thing. And the reality is um, we don't, we'd like to avoid these sort of awkward conversations. And, you know, the, the reality is that as, a, as an association CEO, uh, the idea that we need to we should plan for my eventual departure for whatever reason is an awkward uh thing and the idea that i have to engage with my board or vice versa the board has to engage with me about this conversation is an is an awkward thing and it's um uh it's bound up in our on, on our self-identity it's bound up in our 
uh, thinking about uh, our uh, status and power, mm -hmm. um, it's uh, bound up in our relationships with each other. And so it's um, it's a uh, one of those things. It's like going to a uh, family Thanksgiving dinner, and you know you don't want to sit next to Uncle uh, Tom because he's going to bring up things that are going to be awkward, and we'd rather avoid that. <laughs> Do you find that to be the case too, Lorraine? Is that is that pretty much your experience? Well, I, I think it's a really great point, Gary. I do agree with that. I think what's starting to happen more and more are that uh, boards are expecting this mm -hmm. type of a, a process to, to happen. I, I'm finding that uh, with respect to my clients, more and more of the corporate boards are proactive around this because in their own companies, that's expected that they do that. So it's something very familiar to them. And so I think you're going to see an enhanced and, and greater trend the expectation that CEOs uh, put in place and work with their, their leadership of their board to have a plan in place, uh, not so much to threaten their uh, role, but to you know think about should certain scenarios happen, how does the board respond? I think that's the trend for the future. So what, do you, what are some of those what are some of those transitions or scenarios that that might crop up that people need to think about because there's more that can happen than um, something as simple as somebody aging or retiring out right it's um, right. there are all kinds of different transitions that can happen um, yeah, right. what are some of those you know about about uh, eight percent of all associations have a transition every year. Uh, that's thousands of associations and they come from as you suggested all sorts of different reasons you know there's the retirement mm -hmm. ones which are you know that they, they happen um more likely um there someone's going to leave for another job another opportunity and that happens all the time uh it's what uh, helps keep uh, great firms like corn ferry uh, uh you know in business working to find uh, new talent um uh, there's also the, the reality that uh, people are let go. They're terminated for, for whatever reason, uh, sort of involuntary separation. Um, and then there's also, you know, the issues of um, uh, death. I mean, it does happen that association CEOs or any business leader, um, you know, the, these things do happen that you, you die in office. And, and then there's also a, a different kind of transition, um, a short term transition. You know, we don't think of that as a transition because we're not going from not going away, yeah. you know, but we do go away temporarily, whether that's three months for uh, maternity leave or adoption leave or whatever that might be, or um, somebody has a, a heart attack or a significant health emergency and they're out of uh, out of uh, the ability to, to work for three to nine, nine months or 12 months. Um, so those are all different kinds of transitions and, and um, they're, they're all facts of life. And that's the, that's the thing about these things is, you know, that's, they're, they're not, we're not uh, talking about something that is theoretical. These things happen and they happen with great frequency. Right. Well, I'd love to add on to that. I see, um, in addition to everything Gary said, and I see that all the time, uh, we're starting to see more and more uh, that boards are not necessarily looking to have a leader in place for 15 or more years. That was There was a time that that was pervasive. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think more and more organizations, the reason you're seeing a more seven-year average, and some is a little less and some is a little more, because there's a feeling that having a fresh uh, point of view in an organization is actually healthy for an organization. I think another reason is the sheer disruption that is facing the entire sector. Right. And to accommodate that, there are many great CEOs in the role who have been terrific at transforming their organization to be relevant and poised for the future. In other cases, there are people who are very good uh, with sort of the former, you know, organization, how things used to be done, but aren't equipped to take the organization forward over the next five years. Mm -hmm. And boards are figuring that out. And we're seeing that happen not only in trade associations, but very heavily in professional societies where the demographics of members are going through dramatic change and the needs are going through dramatic change. And so we're seeing turnover in those kinds of organizations even faster than we did uh, years ago because of that need to have people in place who are really equipped to look at things completely differently than it has in the past. So I think that's another trend that you're going to see accelerate. Yeah, that's the fit of uh, talent to strategy. You know, the, the idea that someone might be the appropriate person to lead us 
uh, during this period of our organizational development, but not necessarily the next. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, the, the things have changed in the field and, and therefore the leadership needs to change. Um, that's more common perhaps in the corporate uh, sector that we've seen in the association sector traditionally where it's been, you know, we got someone, we hang on to them as long as we possibly can. Um, but the reality is um, talent uh, is a significant, is a major component of strategy and um, uh, smart boards think about that fit of talent and strategy. Right. Well, you, you know, and I'm wondering, is it, is it uncommon for the CEO or the executive director to sort of initiate a conversation around succession planning or is it not. I mean, you know, is it is it usually that Lorraine? Do you usually see people that are coming to Corn Ferry saying it, it's something that the board is pushing and that they want to initiate this this type of engagement? Or is it's, it... it's, a, it's a great question, Kiki. Uh, I've had both. I, I've had okay. situations. I, I'm in the middle of one now where it actually was the CEO that was proactive, in that they are doing their own career planning and they uh, are. Mm -hmm very much enjoying the organization, but they don't envision themselves staying 10 years. And uh, they highly regard their staff. And, and in this example, they feel they have some internal candidates who, if properly groomed for the future, they may be able to elevate somebody's fairly large organization, which is exciting when you think about it, and wanted to get buy-in from the board for the strategy. So they were proactive in going to the board and said, we ought to initiate this. And I'd like to identify some potential internal successors that we focus on and develop that talent over the next few years with the idea that somebody might emerge versus going outside to the market for a new search. Mm -hmm. And that, was, that went over very well with the board. So that would be an example of a very enlightened and proactive uh, CEO. And in other cases, I've received calls uh, that or everything from we want to engage in a full succession planning process with you, meaning stopping short of doing the search, or just basically pulling together a list of firms that we're going to hand to the board, and if anything should change, they know who to call. So they're pre-screening. They're pre-screening the firms that they're going to recommend to their board so they don't have to start uh, like Well, so um, what is the typical process look like i mean one of the things that um one of the things that i i know gary that when you wrote this book what prompted you to write the book uh you said you you went out and looked for information about succession planning and there just wasn't a lot of really helpful information that was out there so you thought it would be a good thing to put this together um what what is the the typical type of process or maybe the ideal type of process when, when you start approaching um, succession planning? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I was, um, I was not one of those uh, CEOs who was a proactive uh, visionary that said, gee, I really need to do this uh, for the betterment of my organization. <laughs> uh, I freaked out when my board at the Association for Corporate Growth back seven years ago uh, said, we love you, we want you to stay until you retire, but uh, by the way, could you do a succession plan for us? Uh, you know, and have it at the you know next board meeting. And I was like, why would you want? Why look that bad? I mean, seriously, you know, there's something that you know that I don't know of. And um, and, and I wasn't excited about it. And uh, but you know, the board won, and I understood it. I and they were business people, so they look at it from a business perspective. Um, for them, it was a a question of risk management, and that was that's the right way to think about it. Um, and um, so I started to, to research it and found um, other than uh, encouragement that you should have a succession and transition plan, there were no real models or samples or just a list or table of contents or what goes in one. Um, so that, that's what eventually led me to, to this process. Um, but I do think that, you know, where does the process start? I think um, that uh, boards, uh, 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 need to recognize that it is part of their fundamental uh, responsibility as the stewards of the organization and of the profession or industry uh, to be responsible for the continuity uh, and ultimate, uh, you know, the continuation of the of the organization uh, going forward. Um, I think that's where that's where the responsibility really 
rests. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in reality, it, it does take the, uh, the executive, uh, the incumbent executive to work with uh, firms like Corn Ferry or others to uh, think through the process. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what I, I recommend is a, a comprehensive uh, 360 sort of viewpoint of this, not just here's, you know, there's a file in my desk drawer and there's, in it is a name of my designated successor, or there's a list of firms to, to contact, you know, that sort of thing. We have to think a little bit more, uh, more uh, comprehensively than that. Um, and uh, Lorraine will, will probably, can probably tell you about how they go, go about it. And that might be the, the, the more, uh, the, uh, the best way to start this conversation. Okay. Great. I'm happy to, Gary. So I'll give you an example of a typical engagement where we're involved in succession planning with an association's board. And that's mm -hmm. the key. It's usually with the board directly. And uh, we take the time to meet with, uh, at a minimum, the executive committee or officers. And some boards are smaller than, you know, others are very large. Uh, so if, if it's a relatively small board, we literally will meet individually with each member of the board and give them an opportunity to talk about what they foresee as the challenges and opportunities that are facing that association over the next five years or so. Get their perspective on the table. And I assure you, they have a lot to say uh, when we do that. And we simply pull together those trends to see where we have common agreement and differences of opinion from the sitting board that's, that's interested in this plan. The second thing that we do is we ask them to envision, you know, in the future, what kind of, to your point, Gary, what kind of talent do they feel they're going to need in this role to execute against those challenges? And so we engage in a conversation at the same time uh, with those individuals around that to see if they have a common vision. And sometimes you, it's amazing they're so well aligned. And other times they couldn't be more diverse if you tried, which tells you right up front you have a problem. You even have a problem with the incumbent because they're all over the place in terms of what they really want in their CEO. So that gets reflected back to them so they can listen to where they have consensus and differences of, of you. Corn Ferry does one other thing, and it's it's through a tool that we we actually have a, a an assessment tool that we use with a board to help them determine what kind of leadership competencies they want for the future, and we engage that board in this process, all with the goal of frankly creating for them a fresh position description. It's amazing, you know. Sometimes you have leaders in these roles for a long time; it's been years since they've actually created a, a fresh position description for the role, and and so it's all updated. Uh, and oftentimes that's where we'll stop. So they have this description, they've listened to each other, it's something that they understand and, and they're ready to go if God forbid, you know, they have to move forward and do that. Sometimes they'll actually ask us to meet with the senior staff. That's how open they are. Not every group, some groups keep it pretty confidential, but others that want to engage the staff so that they're not worried that something's going on here, you know, right. this firm talking to our board and, you know, yeah. our CEO losing hers or his job. And so by doing that, uh, it, it really takes that concern off the table. So they know we're being very proactive and it's just good governance. So I've had situations where I've met with that next tier of staff and, and just engage them as well. This is a very healthy process, and obviously it takes a strong CEO to endure what I just described. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, what this, what this makes me think is that, you know, we were talking about the emotions. Um, even before we jumped on and went live, we were talking about uh, the emotions that are involved in this particular subject. And when you bring up succession planning, there's the fear, there's the the worry and the concern um, that sort of naturally erupts. And I, I do, I'm going to interrupt myself right now and say, I see you, Georgia. Georgia says, hi, Gary, we've known this was coming for 20 years. What are you doing to help associations through denial? Not just a river in Egypt. And then over <laughs> on Facebook Live, I see you, Michael, and I see you, Lee, saying hello and yes, thanks. And, and that is the benefit of participating live is that you get a chance to ask your questions and make your comments. So I encourage all of you to continue to do that. Um, but where I was going with this was, was to say on the emotions front, does it ever get easier? So when you start this process um, and you maybe make it past that initial awkward 
uh, stage of, uh, if I do this, am I going to lose my job? You know, <laughs> like, I don't want to make it easy um, for me to, to leave my position. Does it ever get easier? Does it do the conversations as you work and navigate through that secession planning process? Um, does it get easier? Well, I can tell you uh, when I finally got around to doing the one at, uh, at ACG, uh, and after I, I spent about a year, uh, not full time, but a year here and there uh, doing research, trying to figure out if there were models or samples and talking to uh, the people that I knew, uh, trying to gather ideas about what would what would uh, a succession plan look like. Uh, when I started, actually got into the process, which I primarily did then uh, with uh, my then CFO uh, uh, at ACG, we, we worked hand in glove together on in this process, and then with the senior leadership of the board. Now, understand, I did not, in you know, in this plan, designate a specific successor. Ultimately, it, it, it gave interim, you know, who, who might be the interim for these different scenarios. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, then you need to do a search, right? Because mm -hmm. that was one of the questions that the board suggested to me that, you know, designate your successor. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that because, you know, I'm, I was at that time like 55 or something. And uh, I was projecting, you know, to retire at 70. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to be able to pick some of my team, you know, 15 years in advance. And it's not healthy. They're probably not. And, but they, that, we had to have that conversation because that was the, what was in their head, right? right? And they said, well, assume you're going to be here for, you know, to your son. They're like, they probably won't because they're going to retire much earlier. They've done a <laughs> um, so the bottom line was once we actually began uh, the process and had conversations and started thinking through these things, um, you know, it, it got easier. And for me, it became, you know, I'm a, I'm an organizer. I like to, you know, see checklists and that sort of thing and uh, think through, through things uh, methodically. Um, so for me, it became uh, a kind of a fun exercise because that's, this is what, this is how my life is. This is what is fun in my life uh, <laughs> to really provide this sort of comprehensive 360 degree viewpoint of this process. So, for me, I thought uh, it was actually a, a good process, and um, uh, and then actually I shared kind of a generic version of, of our plan uh, with some of my colleagues uh, because they were looking for it, and uh, they then you know had, had suggestions and hey you should include that, and so it became for me this sort of intellectual exercise, which eventually was what led to uh, the book. Well, we're, that was uh, we're, that was one hundred. Um, Lorraine, um, Lorraine, were you, were you about, you about to say something? Or? Okay. So I, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what were some of the discoveries that you had, some of the unexpected things that came from uh, when you started investigating the book, when you started researching this and going about this process. Uh, people were res responding. They were saying, hey, change this, add this, do this. Were there any surprises, any, any lessons that you learned from that that um, you weren't expecting? There were there were several surprises. Uh, I interviewed about twenty five people for the book, uh, uh, search uh, firms like uh, like Lorraine, um, uh, the lawyers, CPA people, um, uh, uh, many current and retired association CEOs. Um, I tried to really you know get get a sort of community perspective on this. And one of the things I learned was even some of the most large sophisticated organizations groups with you know 50 80 million dollar budgets didn't really have a transition plan in the bank they didn't have one in the desk drawer mm -hmm. so to speak they had um list of firms that they would recommend or interim executive firms that they'd recommend uh but not a comprehensive view in any way so that was and that was very very uh, consistent from group to group to group uh, some might have had a piece of that uh, plan, but not a comprehensive plan. Number one, uh, no, number two, um, uh, the 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 idea that um, uh, there there's more than one sort of type of transition or succession um, was was not something that most people thought about. The idea that, especially, I have to say, uh, sudden death. Yeah, and I, I hate to sort of cast a bug. And I know. Learn it earlier. It's like oh. But the reality is it does happen. And uh, we have incidents every year where this, this happens to us um, in, our, in our community. So people didn't want to address that kind of thing. Uh, they could see a retirement scenario in their head. They could deal with, 
you know, I decided to move on to a different job, but they didn't want to touch the other sort of uh, more awkward uh, conversations, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then the other thing I, I didn't, I found sort of interesting in this process was uh, conversations around the, the that uh, connection uh, of continuity uh, to uh, an onboarding and uh, utilizing consultants past the transition, past the placement of the executive to help um, the new executive, the, the newly placed executive um, get, get through not only the onboarding, but assessment of personnel, mm -hmm. uh, understanding the trends and issues with that uh, uh, the group and the uh, industry and utilizing c consultants through, through sort of that first year of onboarding and transition. Well, so well, that so brings up a, a, a question, question that I have that has to do with timing. So, you know, if you're looking at onboarding and you realize that all of these things are connected, this whole process is, is connected, really, when's the right time? What is the best sort of situation, Lorraine, for, for someone to say, okay, we're ready to do this work? You know, I think if it becomes an event, it's where that's where it becomes very emotional. If it becomes the norm for an organization to always have in place, um, and maybe even calling it succession itself is a little bit intimidating. You know, uh -huh. sometimes it's it's should should something happen dot dot dot. You know, it's a sort of thing because sometimes succession. Uh, particularly for someone who's been in a role for a while, is actually, as, as we just heard, uh, it, 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 it's something that people resist unless unless required. So I think if it becomes the norm that we as an organization, to Gary's point, for risk mitigation purposes, for productivity purposes, simply want to have a clear process in place should something happen. You know, when you think about it, let's just not talk about succession planning. Organizations have crisis management plans should something happen. I mean, think of all the different scenarios like that, that you've got in place for the board a plan on how how, how to deal with it. Uh, we do that on legislative matters. You know, if this scenario, then then we're going to respond this way. If, if, you know, the Congress changes, we're going to do this. I mean, there are plans done all the time for organizations to be healthy. So this needs to become just one more thing that an organization naturally does rather than an event. Okay, you've been in the job nine years, time to do a succession plan. Well, that's probably something that's going to elevate one's blood pressure. <laughs> it, just, it doesn't feel right. Versus, well, you know, we've had in place some version of that since the year I started. It's just, we're updating it, we're revising it to be more relevant. I think when we do that, it demystifies it, it becomes the norm, it's good governance. Uh, the Everyone, even in the staff, become a little less anxious. Uh, it, it, all the scenarios that Gary spoke of a moment ago that are not necessarily a full, full blown transition. It could just be an incident. Something happened. They're ready to go. Everyone understands so and so is going to have to take leave. Boom. You know, we know exactly what's going to happen. So that's how I think from a timing perspective, it would be great to get past it being a single event and have that become good business. Right. Right. And you're, I mean, that's really what we're talking about is having it, have it, having it become less of the rarity that it is where it's something that is just incorporated in as, as just normal business. This is expected. So. You know, I think going back to the, the question Georgia Patrick asked uh, earlier, uh, you know, what are we doing? What are we doing about it? I think, you know, for me, I wrote a book, so I, I've done my bit. Uh, so, uh, but I, I think the idea that, you know, through uh, tools like, like uh, association chat and through uh, continuing education in the field, firms like Court Ferry and others uh, talking about this, that it becomes that norm, yeah. right? It becomes just like you have a crisis communication plan, as Lorraine suggested, or you've got a, you know, cybersecurity recovery plan, whatever, all those things. And you think about it, we have all kinds of plans, you know, for, for your convention. You've got all sorts of plans. And what if this happens? What if, but the most important person that's employed by the association, we don't have a plan for, you know, what happens if he or she is no longer able to do the job, right? Right. So I, it has to become more normative behavior than an exceptional thing. Uh, so to, to answer your question personally, uh, you know, uh, to, you know, when should this happen? I, I actually think that it's incumbent upon every CEO to make sure that this is done. Uh, certainly it's the board's responsibility, but I do think that 
Um, there's a, a quote in my book from one of the people I interviewed, and that is, you know, the idea that, you know, you're, you're, the way you arrive and the way you depart and your preparations for both um, say a lot about you as an executive and as a leader. And it also says a lot about the association and its culture. And that has got to become more of a, of a piece of our identity as um, uh, association leaders that we, we feel that responsibility as a steward of the organization to uh, ensure that we have continuity of operation. And so, you know, I've been in my current job now just a little over a year and a half, um, and uh, uh, I'm beginning the process now, my continuity and, and transition plan, in, in part because you know, I wrote the book, so it's be embarrassing if I were to <laughs> die. So and what's there's your no plan? plan? And you're like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> you know do, do as I say, not as I do. But, uh, but I do think that that's important. And by the way, um, just as I had at ACG, we're at uh, Neary, we're going to have uh, transition plans for all the key senior staff members as well. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is not just the CEO leaves, other key, key executives also leave. Absolutely. You know, I, I'll add one other point, um, given that I spend most of my time placing CEOs of these organizations. Among the many search committees that I've listened to, it's not uncommon to have a question come up of the candidates that we're visiting with. Do you have in place a succession plan? And, and what does that look like? And in the debriefs, I can't tell you how many times they have admired the people who are able to articulate that. They see that as very responsible. So it, it's a bonus point for anybody who might be listening to your show uh, to think about that, that it's actually seen as a sign of um, real leadership uh, of an organization to be proactive on that. So another benefit. Yeah, that's good. That's actually a really good tip, you guys. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, Lorraine. So, so when people go about, um, I want to talk a little bit about the book, Gary. Um, when people go about, uh, like oh, they do on TV. Right you got to hold up the book. I know, you know, and I need to get my signed copy. <laughs> Everybody has one but me, apparently. Oh, come on. Well, I'll send you Oh, my gosh. So so when people, uh, when they get the book, not if, or <laughs> when they get the book, what are some of the tools that are uh, in checklists that are involved? I mean, what did you, as you were putting it together, you're like, okay, this is what I'm not finding out there. This is what needs to be concluded right. because it is a toolkit. Correct. Yes. Yeah, it, it's very much a practical uh, a tool um, uh, resource. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, you know, this uh, when you any author will, will know this, but when you uh, work with the publisher, you'll argue about the title of the book and, uh, you know, that sort of things. And so I had a completely different title in mind. But uh, ASAE, um, uh, Baron Williams, as we went through this process, they wanted to utilize use that phrase toolkit because it, the book includes um, uh, not only just checklists within the content uh, context, but there is in the back of the book a what's called a flat USB, mm -hmm. uh, which is a memory stick that includes uh, job descriptions and uh, that sort of thing, but also a, a checklist that is a series of questions or instructions, you know, determine this, decide that, that sort of thing. And you literally can just follow along that whole checklist you, utilizing the word document on the on the in the USB and sort of fill out your own your own process. Now it does not substitute. I want to uh, um, hasten to say um, the process that that Lorraine talked about of interviewing your you know leadership team, getting a better sense of strategy, those kinds of things. But it it at least provides for the average association a tool that they can relatively easily walk through. Uh, they still have to answer hard questions, but it gives you sort of this checklist process. Um, and um, at the end of which, you know, you've, you've got at least a, a serviceable document that provides a continuity and transition plan. And um, there, there may be some questions that you don't want to include, then you just delete them. So it's completely customizable. I, I love that. So if somebody, um, they go through the toolkit and they're like, okay, this is fantastic. I feel like I'm now able to go to Lorraine and work with Corn Ferry to like do this for real, for real and go through this whole process. Um, I'm just imagining this, this hypothetical situation. Where can the process go wrong? Like Lorraine, you've probably seen where once you get started, uh, things are rolling along and then they don't, then they're not anymore. 
um, where can things go go wrong? So it's very important when you lead a process like this to understand the motivations of the people who are involved from the board. Uh, and you go into these processes hoping that everybody's there for the right reason. Uh, oh. Every now and then there might be somebody who has an agenda or they have a particular point they want to push. So it's important for a firm like ours or others who are doing this work to, to be very uh, careful as to how they use the information. Really, that's why we spend time talking, frankly, to either all executive committee members or in a smaller board setting, sometimes the entire board. So we can isolate the aberrations as opposed to, look, you know, we've taught there were 10 people, nine of them feel this this way. And there's one person that has a totally different viewpoint. And let's just really understand why. And so mm -hmm. we can you know, react to perhaps something that's an aberration. Uh, so that's that's when you sometimes run into situations when you when you have something uh, percolate that's really a, the wrong motivation based based on somebody like that. The second opportunity for a problem is if you're talking to staff and staff gets anxious. You have to very carefully, if you're going to go to that level of, of detail, uh, or that the, and this is what I do, I generally have both the uh, incumbent CEO and the chair of the board speak to the staff first and let them know things are fine. This is good governance. We're doing what we think is the responsible thing for our association. And then have the CEO reiterate that and underscore that so that they don't think it's being done behind the back of the CEO. And then they, they have a conversation and it's very comfortable. But these are things that you need to do up front. Really think through uh, and anticipate how these different audiences are going to respond. If you don't do it, you can lose people. People can start getting resumes on the street. They could think the organization's going to be in transition. They, they make up all kinds of scenarios that were in trouble. None of it is true, but they imagine things. So I think that's those are two examples that I can speak of that I, I know we have to be very careful in how we handle this, respectful of all the parties. Yeah, you know, I, I and it really is that communication piece that does seem to be so critical because, Absolutely. and I've noticed since we started talking even before we went live um some of the terms some of the phrases that get brought up um over and over i i, I love this is sort of reframing it as good governance and um, continuity uh of operations and risk mit risk mitigation and it's just showing that that um, you can reframe it as something where um, you're being proactive. You're you're actually just trying to be responsible, stable, and and safe about the way that you go go about things. Um, and so, with the communication, is it ever a problem when uh, you have? And Lorraine, this is another question for you. Is there is it ever a problem that you have a CEO or executive director who just doesn't want to go along on this process or makes it more difficult. Do you run into that? So, so far, I have not run into that because it's generally the CEO who does the outreach to us for for the purposes of a succession plan. Certainly, if it's that's a search, you know, that's mm -hmm. going to ensue. It's not uncommon to have the board reach out. But in most cases, it is the CEO uh, or executive director who's reaching out on behalf of the board uh, and. Uh, so there are I, I've been fortunate. Perhaps the cases that I've been involved with, the, the, the CEO is generally quite uh, cooperative and engaged. Uh, and it's also, I think, our role as, as their consultant to, to, to ensure that they feel part of the process, that they're not isolated, uh, that they know what to expect. I think that's also important that, you know, now once, once this project is done, what does that mean for me? You know, what's the outcome of it? Uh, and one thing I can assure your, your listeners who might be sitting CEOs, uh, when we're in this process, the purpose of these conversations is not to do a performance review of the CEO. That is not what we're talking about. In fact, we're very careful to frame the conversation about perspective, you know, mm -hmm. years out. And so, you know, if somebody wants to go there, we actually say, you know, that's not really the purpose of our conversation today. We're doing future, we're, you know, plans. And, and uh, you know, certainly, you know, as a board, you can have those conversations. But that's not really what I'm here for. So I think that's also very important to set parameters 
uh, for sort of the, the scope of what our conversations are meant to do. And again, I think that helps the CEOs to understand. So what are some of the secession planning problems, not in necessarily um, the process, but some of maybe the, the issues that you come across as you're going through it that are, that are difficult to work through? And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, maybe it's uh, ambiguity or personalities that, that interact. What are some of the problems that, that you come across? So, Gary, I'll, I'll just start here. One of the things that I've observed is, uh, particularly when you've had a, a, a sitting CEO in the role for a number of years, it's not unusual for the entire board to have turned over mm. at the time they were selected. And uh, when that happens, you know, you hope that the CEO has done their job to build relationships that are deep with all of the new people as they come in. But that's not always the case. And it's not uncommon that I get hired because that didn't happen. And mm -hmm. some kind of issue occurred and the trust wasn't built. Uh, the C for whatever reason, that CEO hasn't um, built the, um, shall, you know, the credibility they need uh, to, to, be, to, to really be given the benefit of the doubt on a matter. It happens. And then things go sideways. And the next thing you know, we get a call. So I would say that um, first thing that I would tell every CEO is do not stop building those deep relationships. Go out of your way every time you have somebody new and they're going through board orientation to personally engage with those people, not just once, but on an ongoing basis. So that what I just described hopefully doesn't happen and it doesn't get to the point where you really don't have a lot of friends on that board. All new chairman and vice chair are in different officers and they don't know you. I mean, mm -hmm. they know you, but they really don't know you. So don't take it for granted. So that's where I tend to see things go really sideways uh, in a process like this. So that, that's one example. But Gary, you may have some other ones. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very insightful, uh, you know, uh, piece of knowledge there. Uh, you know, uh, many executives will say that, you know, once uh, once all of their the board who hired them have rotated off and they have a completely new board, they realize that the board that hired them had, had the most uh, level of deepest level of investment in them personally. And the new people, you know, it, it's more transactional, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, smart ones, as Lorraine suggested, will build those relationships, deepen those relationships over time. Others don't realize that they should or need to or, or don't fully do that. Mm -hmm. So I can totally see where that's a problem. Um, you know, in, in the it was interesting as I had conversations with executives in writing this book, um, I did have some people take me to task by saying, by saying, well, why do you want to have a book like this? Because now my board's going to expect me to do this and I don't want to do this. Right. Because <laughs> oh, they, really? they're, That's Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, people were not, I mean, mostly people were pretty happy about it, but yeah. I did have some people say, no, I, I don't want my board to think about this. And even in, even in the interview process, people that, collaborated with me on, on, on the book. There were people said, yeah, you know, I'm not sure that I would want my board to have such a comprehensive plan. I want them to know these three things, right? It's the old, tell them what I want them to know and know nothing else, right? right. Um, so then it, it's not universally, uh, you know, was universally welcomed. Some of the other issues that, um, uh, uh, that I ran into personally when in, in doing my plan uh, at ACG, uh, and I've talked, spoken with others, the same thing. Um, there often comes the opportunity to su suggest, you know, in this scenario, uh, short-term leave, right? Yeah, you, you have a, a family leave or you have a heart attack, you know, short to longer-term leave. Um, who would you want to designate as an interim? And today we have many options. You, there are firms that do nothing but uh, interim uh, work. Um, and then, but off, often somebody will say, well, we need to get, get to pick somebody from the staff. Well, that's where sometimes it gets a little tricky because you as an executive, as the CEO, now have to designate one or maybe two people to be that interim person. And you know that, first of all, you should talk to them and make sure they'd accept the job, number one, but number two, you may not have a clear uh, interim right there sitting and then the office is next to you, or you may be uncertain as to which one of two or three might be the, the proper ones. And so it starts to get 
um, it, it, a little bit of a challenge uh, for you to say, well, I'm designating person X hmm. or person Y in the event that I'm, you know, uh, suddenly unavailable. Um, and um, that that's where it can go off the rails pretty quickly because it forces you to make decisions. Yeah. It forces you to make a choice. So what, oh, go ahead. I was just going to comment. I said two examples came to mind when you were talking about that, Gary. Um, I had a situation where there was an abrupt change in an executive director and they had not done the planning. And rather than, so then the person was, had left. And rather than doing, um, having a plan in place, the search or the search committee and the board selected three people to be the interim at the same time. And if you could only, yes. This really happened. And so wow. what <laughs> happened, uh, is that they were butting heads for months. And these were not people who naturally got along. And mm -hmm. there's always a little bit of competition. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was not done in a way that made sense. You know, rather than having a clear designee before the event occurred, it, it was it was a it was well, they work well together, they'd be fine. And it really was a disaster. They 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 did damage the organization. Uh, so I think that was one example. Another example is where nobody was designated and someone from the board who was in retirement stepped up and decided to be the chairperson for the duration. And look, th these people, you know, are volunteers, they put so much time and energy into doing what they do, but they really weren't equipped to be in the association. They were just available. And so that was also, that did not go well. And so the, the challenges are you have is if you don't plan for it and do it the right way, something is going to be done. It just may be very disruptive right. to the organization uh, in the interim. So it's going to happen and why not do it the right way? Mm -hmm. Exactly. exactly. I, I think that, that idea that something is going to happen, uh, you know, has to happen, whether even if it's nothing, that's still something that then happens, right? We're not going to designate anybody so a vacuum exists. Uh, in the book, I talk about those different options. You know, you, you pick a, a designated staff member, you pick a volunteer, you have the, God forbid, the uh, executive committee, you know, serve as the, you know, office of the, of the CEO. Uh, and I sort of touch on all those different options and talk about the pros and the cons of each. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I clearly have a, a point of view, uh, which is to, in, in the, the appropriate cases to use uh, someone in, uh, on the staff inside or you use an interim professional service of, of one kind or another. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea, and I think Brian's absolutely right, if you do nothing, some things will happen yeah. that you may not like. <laughs> you, you will like work less than the loss of your CEO. Right. You know? I think I, I forget how it goes, but um, I saw something somewhere, heard something somewhere about uh, if you don't make the decision, the decision will be made for you. And so it's 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 not a good strategy to just wait for things to sort of figure themselves out, I guess. You know, I wanted to just plant one more point, and, and I'm speaking about recruitment. Uh, so let's assume we're not dealing necessarily with a retirement, but somebody who might have a career path after whatever the role is that they're in. Mm -hmm. so at some point, we do referencing on mm -hmm you know, individuals who are finalists in, a, in an opportunity. And it goes to something Gary said, which is very important. You know, you have, you're hired, you you have an onboarding, you, you do your work, and then you leave. And it might, you might have left because you got a new job, you might have left in other circumstances, whatever they may be. Well, you got to hope that people you left behind have something positive to say about you. And one of the things that people remember is, what it was like when you left. That's the last thing they remember is with things in order or did you uncover all kinds of problems when you left? Did you leave things in disarray? You know, did, did, did for six months that our, were our staff very frustrated because you hadn't buttoned things up and had a plan in place and they'll blame, they'll blame that person. So when you think about it, it's, it, it's all a plus for somebody who's got future roles, not just a retirement scenario. I wanted to put it, put on the table. Succession planning isn't only for people retiring. Uh, that your reputation will follow you and in, in also the way you leave an organization in place. So just something to plan. It, it's part of that story, again, part of your narrative that you're proactive, you really think about good governance, you did the right thing for the, the industry or the sector or the nonprofit, and your reputation is intact. So it's another plus to doing this well. Is there anything about the executive search process that is connected to secession planning that we haven't touched on that that is important for people to know 
um, about this because it's definitely something that I haven't had a lot of experience in um, thinking about. But it, are there elements that we still need to discuss that people should know about I don't know, how to do it better, how to do it well, th things that they need to consider? Yeah, one thing I would just raise, and, and I'm reflecting on another num succession plan I did a number of years ago for an organization, again, really being proactive. Uh, mm -hmm. There was no search in place for a number of years. It was really just good governance. Is that if when you, you do a process like I'm speaking of, but maybe years go by, two, three years go by that you haven't refreshed it, you got to refresh it because you have a different mm -hmm. board in place and you can't assume that the, the new board that's seated are thinking the exact same thing that the board three years or four years ago were thinking. And that could be a real derailer because if you come in and say, this is the direction we're going because that's what the board three or four years ago had to say, uh, you could be going down a path of, you know, um, that, that could be wrong. And the, and the industry or the sector or whatever, the environment has changed and it's wrong. So that's the one thing I would say is that this is not a one-time thing. These things need to be put in place, but consistently updated and refreshed to reflect the changing dynamics of the organization that you are working with. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was uh, interviewing people for the book, uh, I also interviewed some uh, management consultants, people that do broader, uh, not executive search, but other kinds of strategic planning and, and whatnot. And, um, uh, you know, one of the, the sort of things that they said, uh, and, and I got the same thing from other CEOs, um, was that there's still there, not a lot of people actually know how this search process happens, how it works, yeah. how much time it takes. Um, you know, the other way of thinking about this is many people on the board that are the ones now charged with you know, doing the search, many of them have never gone through a search process or have gone through one you know, we, with decades in between, right? So it's not exactly. just me. I no, it's not, not just. I don't you. even and, know what what the right questions are to ask because I don't I don't know enough right. about it, right? It, and it's and it's much more sophisticated and comprehensive and full of uh, challenges than people realize. And yeah. you know, in in the book, I talk about uh, the uh, uh, the fundamental options of uh, uh, doing your own search. In other words, the board does its own you know self guided search, or hiring a professional uh, firm. And um, so I gave, uh, I talked about both and sort of painted, you know, things to think about as you go through this process. Now, again, I have a point of view. I think the point of, my point of view is, you know, for most associations, uh, it pays to utilize an outside uh, search firm. Uh, but if, you, if you're going to do one, you need to think about all these different issues, human human resources issues, and talent that fit to talent, and uh, trying to find the diverse pool and all those kinds of issues that you, you might not have thought about. But the fundamental thing that I really found out was you know, they don't really know how to do one or how long it's going to take because they'll well we can I can we can get someone here in three months no problem at all we'll just put an ad in the paper we'll get someone tomorrow <laughs> you know. They right. can spell. Uh, they can spell association. That's good enough for me. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! It gives me like chills, and not in a good way. Hearing you say that, but you know, it is true though. I bet that um, people just don't know how long the process is going to be, or how long it can take. Um, do we have any figures or statistics on that? Do you have a, like a general sort of feel for how long it takes usually? Absolutely. On average, they're about four months. Wow. On average, and and then depending on the circumstance, if it, there's a retirement that's planned, it could be a longer process to to fit the needs of the organization. But for a full search committee uh, led um, uh, search, where a board ultimately has to vote on a finalist, you, you could easily plan four months. Okay, so I I want to wrap this up because I know that you have something right after this, um, Lorraine, and I also um, I have to say. You guys have done, you've been a 10 out of a 10 as far as guests, just answering fantastic questions. Your answers have been wonderful. And this is all with Gary being jet lagged after traveling all around the world over the past. Just, just got home from Amsterdam I mean, last night. <laughs> we waited to tell one in a couple of days. So. Really well pulled right. together. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you if, if there's anything, any final thoughts, any any final words you think it's important for people to think about or know uh, about this topic before we we close out for today? Lorraine? Well, I think it's something that uh, 
don't fear it, actually embrace it and and think about how this could be, frankly, to your advantage and that of the organization. I strongly believe that this is the wave of the future and it's best that a CEO take this on proactively than wait to be told to do this. Uh, where they define what they want, you define it. You know, you take take the action and I think it will serve you very well. And there are, there are people and resources and the likes of someone like Gary, who's got just incredible experience and I think his book is terrific. You can get the book. Uh, you can certainly reach out to me and I'm sure there are others as well. Uh, be proactive about it and, uh, and, and, and do not fear it. I love it. Yeah, you know, my, my thought is buy the book. Uh, by the way, all <laughs> pros, proceeds go to the ASA Foundation, so uh, I'm not doing this from a, from a commercial standpoint, but uh, uh, it's uh, 70 bucks if you're, uh, you know, a member, uh, and that will certainly save you a few hours of, of research and development. D buy the book or talk to your colleagues or visit with the ex experts like, like Lorraine and, or others. Um, is understand what it is and why. Uh, ultimately, my my to my colleagues in the association community, I'll say, this is part of your legacy. Mm. You know, it's a, it's a legacy of leadership as to how you leave this organization or your organization. And um, uh, you know, we 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 all feel responsible uh, to do our best job every single day for our groups. We should make sure that we do our best job, especially on that last day, the day that we're we're walking out of the door, because that's what, as Lorraine said. That's what people are going to remember. Well, well said. And with that, I hope that the legacy of association chat is that all of you will be able to leave this discussion today, having learned something that is extremely valuable or helpful for you in your jobs. So until next time, everyone, keep asking questions to learn every day. As Joseph Campbell once said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Aha. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you so much for being a part of this today. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.